different ways that you all have either engaged with students or anyone else to, to learn more about um, adjusting your application? Sure. Um, from 2017, 2018, 2019, we actually were present in the community. We physically went and visited um, and spoke at eight different churches in the uh, Ward 5 sector. Um, we presented in front of three different community groups um, over the course of 2018 and 2019 after we were sort of revisiting our initial plan with you guys. Um, and so we were able to, over the course of our community engagements, even including our boys and girls clubs, our rec centers, um, we were able to get over 300 people to sign a letter of support for our school. Um, and I believe it's about 47% of those people are confirmed parents and guardians of students um, in the District of Columbia. Um, we also received, I think it was like 34, 35 intent to enroll forms, which is just under 50% of our targeted enrollment. Um, we had to shift a little bit because of COVID. Uh, we had plans to sort of continue that face-to-face -face engagement, um, but had to shift during COVID and move to sort of virtual marketing, which we endeavor to sort of continue in the year, the upcoming year, in the event that we're not able to resume face-to-face -face, uh, meetings and operations. Jim? Thank you. Well, thank you for your presentation and thank you for your patience tonight. You've had a long wait. Uh, looking at your founding group and the proposed members of your board, uh, you don't yet appear to have experience with special education and English language, English learning uh, supports among your group. How do you propose to bring that into your school? Well, actually, Jim, we do have as a part of our design team, several members of our team who are actually certified special education professionals. Um, so even in terms of who is represented today, Tracy Cooper, Skyler are both uh, special education certified. Uh, we had Kim who was on our board, Karen, who are part of our design team with special education certified. Uh, Azura Afamo uh, is a special She's a Spanish speaking um, business operator for charter schools. Um, we have another person, Sarah, who was also certified for ELL and special education on our, on our design team. Um, so while they're not necessarily represented on the board, we did have them as a part and they continue to be a part of our design. And I will we'll be in advising capacities as we bring, bring the school up and move the school forward. And just to add into what LaShondra was saying, we have a wealth of experience. My, um, my background began in special education and continued. And um, I'm able to, I have service students from a wide range of levels and disabilities, and I am able to add into the design process. And we are well-versed and we collaborate and we are able to access others who will help um, add in and develop our programming and to support the work that we're doing for students. If I'm understanding your, you're talking about the design, but once the school is up and running, how are you, how are you gonna staff these needs? So we actually created what we're calling a special populations office. And so the special populations office will house a coordinator, will house our resource teachers, our paraprofessionals. We also have ESOL um, teachers in that office, interpreters, et cetera, in our special populations office. So those persons will be tasked on a daily basis with meeting the needs of the uh, students in those various subgroups. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question, Rick. Yeah. So you have a, a, an innovative financing model where you have uh, services attached to the school, uh, aftercare, summer camps, things of that nature um, that you're going to use to generate revenue. Um, what I'm wondering is, it looks like you're also um, focused on families in neighborhoods that are low income how do you, uh, do you expect that there'll be enough families that can pay for these services to work those numbers into your uh, financing model? Yes, actually. And so that's where the churches kind of come in. Um, the churches have been uh, and have expressed the value and the support of 
um, getting behind our school and our school initiative. And so several of the, church, the churches that we spoke with have pledged um, financial commitment to sort of help support any voice that may come from their membership who wants to attend. Um, we have several of the churches who have this, uh, this, uh, decided to sponsor children in terms of coming to our summer programming. Now, while we can't necessarily say for certain um, how much that's going to be, we try to project based on the commitment from the churches we have. Um, but we're also looking to expand that out. Um, we did sort of a hard push in 2019, had hoped to really sort of get here, hit the ground running with 2020 and engage uh, many of the churches because there are, there are plenty more uh, organizations than, that we can tap into. Um, and so we're hoping that based on what we have and in our plans for moving forward, we're confident that we should be able to support that, um, those, those plans and those projections. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Could you all say um, a little bit <clears throat> about the uh, way that you'll be both recruiting and preparing teachers to deliver this particular um, program since it has so many facets to it? Um, well, I'll start off and then Tracy and Skylar can jump in if they want to. Um, so the good part is that what we're, what we're offering in terms of our plan is it is unique. However, the core and the foundational component of our plan for students is, to, is, is going to be something that is on par with what the national standards and the recognized DC standards are for learning, which is a good part. Um, but we do have a significant um, professional development program that we've created, which complements our plan to implement this school program. Um, and so much of that starts before the school opens. And then on a regular basis throughout the year, every other Friday, at least twice a month, we, uh, we school breaks and then we have professional de development sessions that will occur throughout the year, which will also you know, continue to further support and expand our efforts. It also gives us the opportunity to sort of plug in any gaps that we may notice if we need to pivot in any particular areas, our professional development that will continue throughout the year gives us the opportunity to do that. Skylar or Tracy, I don't know. Did I leave anything um, <clears throat> Well. You know, I noticed that you said that we have an innovative program. And while we are going to do some of the traditional things that schools do in order to hire well-qualified, highly certified teachers, innovation requires preparation. And that's why our plan to prepare them is to, it has two phases to it. The first phase is primarily making sure that teachers have the background and expertise necessary to meet children at a variety of different levels from the top learners all the way to the, to the learners who are struggling learners, our ELL students, our special populations. That requires a strong foundation in literacy in both, and that, that includes math literacy as well as reading literacy. The second part of that is the business model. And the business model is really geared towards some of the higher order thinking skills that have been measured in some of the nation's latest um, high stakes assessment test. Um, we're talking about a lot, of, a lot of things that have to do with performance assessment and critical thinking. Now, with regard to that, the way we plan on training teachers is by training each and every one of our teachers to be a reading teacher. I know it's talked about all the time. It's not always fully implemented. Um, in, in the sixth grade, generally in many, in many school districts that have, that have populations of students who are at risk, what we find is that the students are coming in with, with deficits of about two, to, two or more years of, with, with regard to reading. Okay, now, when, when teachers come into our school, they will be trained, one, in how to identify them. After they're trained in how to identify those students who are, who are having difficulty with reading, there's a two-part assessment to that. We use, we'll use formal assessments to uh, measure where, where the students are. We'll use informal assessments to measure why those students are having those difficulties. Are those difficulties because students are having problems with comprehension, um, constructivist-based 
based learning practices or all those students, students having problems because of core foundational things, behaviorist practices. For those students who are having those problems, <clears throat> who are having those problems, we will, we will then identify them and move them into tier two interventions. Okay, the better trained our teachers are able to see those interventions, the better we'll be able to move them into those appropriate categories. Um, finally, then once we once we train teachers to meet the needs of students who are struggling learners, we need to train teachers how to reach the higher level learners. Very often with regard to rigor, most most people think that if a child is reading two to three years above grade level, that that means that, that, mean, that that's where we should be meeting them with all of their needs as far as literacy is concerned. That may or may not necessarily be true. What may happen, for instance, is that when children are, when children are dealing with high level concepts, like a performance-based assessment that might have to do with something like um, creating a pro forma statement, or if not a pro forma statement, doing a SWOT analysis. Then what we found is that, that, is that we need to lower the reading level to that child's independent reading level because the child does not need to struggle with both a higher order, a higher order concepts and reading at the same time. However, when we're introducing new concepts, then we may need to, to give them reading levels that are two to three levels above grade level. Training teachers how to identify that and to, and to meet appropriate reading and math needs in order to prepare students for all levels of learning is exactly how we plan on meeting that. And I will add into that under the auspices of our business um, <clears throat> team and education to incorporate the financial literacy, the business models, the networking, um, the critical thinking, and all of those components will be incorporated both as a part of the model that the teachers are receiving as they're you know, going through that training process as well. Thank you. Um, one other question that just uh, just came to mind on a, on a different note, um, we're talking less about recruiting and developing teachers, but recruiting students is given your plans to um, open in Ward 5 and to some of the conversations we've had across the last few hours about um, demand and the um, enrollment or enrollment challenges we've seen amongst, in particular, middle schools uh, in, um, in Ward 5. Um, how you would think about addressing those demand concerns um, and ensuring that your school was appropriately enrolled. So I think it's a couple parts to how we're going to plan for that. Um, we have a traditional marketing plan that we've set up to sort of support regular traditional enrollment. Um, but then we also, as a part of our target enrollment, we did do an enrollment sensitivity analysis so that we can see um, if we have any issues where we're under enrolled in a particular area, how that impacts operations, et cetera. Um, but then there's the other part about how do we get out in front of people? How do we make ourselves known? How do we differentiate ourselves in the space of COVID in this virtual space? And so we have, uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, already started planning on those contingencies and creating virtual workshops and virtual opportunities to sort of have um, parents to explore because we don't have the, and we, we may not get back the sort of traditional foot, um, foot opportunity and face-to-face -face opportunity. So we have already started curating a series of virtual workshops that we're going to launch. And then we will share those with our community partners in the hopes that they'll disperse that information. And then that way we still have the opportunity to get in front of people we're also having some of some of us have teenage children, so we are also already talking to our children, our, our young adults, about curating um, some uh, ads that we can launch on social media to sort of get the attention of the students, and then hopefully by getting the attention of the students, are then able to tap into the parents. So we're going to continue to do our traditional our traditional marketing plans, but then also sort of pivot to sort of now engage and introduce and incorporate. Um, some non-traditional ways to sort of reach out as well. We did have a little under 50% in 2019 that had committed through um, letters of intent to enroll. Um, so we feel like that's a positive first step. We're just hoping to sort of be able to, get, to catalyze on that in the year to come. What do you think will be the core um, 
selling point for middle schoolers who are at that age of they, they, they're looking, they're making decisions on their own, but they're also um, seeking and needing their family support for a decision to go with, to go with your school. Well, I think students want a place where now, if, if, if we give students the, what is the respect that is due to them, uh, students now want to explore different opportunities to make money. Right. So they're all they're all now starting to explore allowances, being able to buy their own this, being able to have their own that. Uh, I have a 13 year old that is constantly wanting money loaded on his his uh, his personal debit card so that he can fund his PSN activities. Um, and so they're starting to now they're moving in that middle school space. They're starting to explore some of those pre independent sort of moments. And so I think the idea of being able to learn about business, being able to learn about becoming an entrepreneur, developing those financial literacy skills. I think that's all something that is relevant and that connects back to the students because if the student feels like they can demonstrate sort of awareness and understanding of these topics, then it makes them more attractive to their parents who then dole out the allowance. And so our idea is to sort of speak to that capability and then have them, um, and then ha the engagement with the parents then connects the dot of the child coming to our school. And so what we plan to do is similar to some of the other schools that we've heard from is we've designed a, a total program, a wraparound program that supports the full need of the child um, from like, like we said with our summer care program, our, our aftercare before and aftercare programs as needed. We've also looked into uh, various transportation programs as well. Um, so that we don't have any issues in the area of getting people, getting our students to and from our schools. Um, and so we just tried to, as a team, uh, come up with all the issues that we may encounter and some of the things that we would think about as parents, as uh, teachers in the classroom, some of the things that we've seen, and sort of purposely create uh, elements in our school design that address that, if that makes sense. And to add into what LaShondra just said, I had a student recently um, Send, send a message and this was a statement. And this speaks directly to how our program is different and what we're gonna be able to touch on. The student said, no offense to schools, but take offense. Teach me something I'll use. Teach me how to file taxes. Teach me about bills. Um, I'm not gonna use a number line in my life. Teach me basic math operations, fractions and decimal. Teach me how to use money. This was directly stated by a student who is struggling within the context of the space to find some way to have, find meaning within, within the school system. And obviously our goals as educators are to meet those demands, but sometimes we have missed and lost sight of some of the practical applications that life experience gives us. And our model and our business program will help to bridge the gap between the theory and the practical application. I know when I came through school, I left and I know um, in our household and as hardworking as our families were, financial literacy and economics was not something that was always discussed openly. Um, and many families are often um, behind the ball when it comes to understanding the appropriate and effective ways to use money and make money work and grow for them. And then that um, deficit has been translated through to their children and that has been a generational issue and problem in many communities. And I think what makes our school different is our direct approach to addressing some of those practical skills in the context of our instruction, our program options and learning opportunities. And so I think to um, go back to that student's quote, I think our business model and the opportunity for children to really learn how to use those, those dollars to make sense, to change their lives are going to be a tool and a model that is um, going to be transformative for our students and their families. Thank you very much. I appreciate, I appreciate that additional color. Tyler, did you want to add in? Um, I will say this. Um, I remember being a, school, a student in Baltimore City um, in an advanced program, and yet school didn't hold my interest. The reason school didn't hold my interest was because behind closed doors, we had some very serious financial needs that the teachers couldn't see. I got an entrepreneurial opportunity at the age of 13. Um, it was with the Sun Paper. I would basically I had to I had to go out, recruit on my own, get other people to get other people to work with me and sell Sun Paper subscriptions. Through that opportunity, 
I was able to generate at, at most $256 in one week and enough in one month, 400 and something dollars to pay my family's mortgage for one month. That alleviated an incredible amount of family arguments and stress. And there's nothing like that that can actually really pull students in and get them to believe than something that solves their immediate needs and that ties in to their academic performance. That's a great point. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Board members, any other questions this evening for the MECA team? If not, I will close out and thank you all again uh, for your patience this evening, your uh, participation this evening, and all the work that's gone into um, the application. We'll look forward to seeing you and the other applicants uh, next month. Thank you so much for your thank time you with so you. Much. Thank you everyone for hanging in here with us. Yes, and have an amazing afternoon and be safe. <laughs> Get some good sleep. <laughs> Um, all right, we have uh, one more matter of business on the public hearing. Uh, Michelle, who is not a still available? Is someone else going to pick that up for her? No, she's on. She's on. Okay. She's Hi. a trooper. <laughs> yes, I know it's late. Hello, <laughs> my name is Netta Musa. I'm a specialist on the school quality and accountability team. Tonight, the board will discuss I Dream Public Charter Schools requests to append its revised bylaws. The revised bylaws reduced the board term length for parent guardian representative from three years to two years. Currently in its first year of operation, I Dream Public Charter School educates students in grades pre-kindergarten three through second grade at one campus located in Ward 7. For the school's mission, I Dream Public Charter School is an intentionally transformative learning community that nurtures children to imagine and fulfill their dreams and aspirations. I see Janine there. Hey, Rick. Hey, everyone. Good to see you again. You didn't have to stay up this late the first time when you when you applied. Sorry. For no, that. I haven't <laughs> been up this late on purpose in a long time. <laughs> um, you want to give us a quick skinny on what, what you all are trying to do and see if we have any questions at this point? Yeah, I also have, uh, so Candace Gibson is here, our board oh. chair. And I wanted to- Hi, Candace. Sure she Hi, good here. evening. Um, so um, I, I guess the skinny, thank you, Nada, for um, that, that explanation. Um, so in January, the I Dream PCS board voted to amend its bylaws uh, to make parent uh, guardian board terms two years in length. Uh, the measure was discussed extensively um, by the board during our late September and October 2020 meetings. Um, and these meetings were announced to the public and to our learners' families. And so in voting to um, reduce the length of the board term for our parent guardian members, uh, you know, we considered several factors. We wanted to ensure that involve, we wanted to ensure involvement from a wide variety of families. We wanted to ensure that the term was long enough to offer uh, continuity without being overwhelming for these families. And we wanted to ensure that parents and guardians felt like they were assets to our board rather than statutory requirements. And so for these reasons, we felt that a one year board term was too short, but a three year board term um, could possibly be overwhelming for uh, parent guardian members. And, uh, you know, we've received feedback from the parents who are and guardians who are currently on our board. And that confirms um, this, this thought that a three year board term for a parent guardian member is a long time. And even if they don't have, you know, plans to remove their learners from the school, committing to serve on the board for three years was very long. Um, you know, we wanted to give them an opportunity to, to get comfortable and you, you know, that usually doesn't happen after a year, but, you know, one year to get comfortable and know what they were doing and then another year to, to do the work of the board. If they feel comfortable, um, you know, they do have the option to, uh, 
remain for an additional board term, but we thought that three years for the parents and the feedback that we've received um, was just too much. So the board voted uh, to uh, add a add specific language rather for parent um, guardian board members that make that term two years. Thank you. Open it up to any board members who have any questions. Um, I'll just say, I think, uh, you know, I think one of one of the most important things is making sure that our parent board members feel as much a part of the board, if not more, um, for the investment that they're making in their students. So uh, I, I always think to how changes like this um, do more or less to make them feel part of that. Um, and I appreciate your your thoughtful approach uh, to finding a way to engage them um, more and in ways that make sense, uh, it makes sense for them. So for my part, I'm appreciative of that. Thank you. And I will take silence on the part of my board members is thinking that they also agree okay. with that strategy at this time. It's the 1143, <laughs> we have nothing left to offer, you know, our. <laughs> If you can give me the elevator pitch version of the this this response, that'll be perfect. Um, thank you uh, for the walking us through your explanation. I'd also like to know with you all uh, opening um, in this really interesting year, how things are going um, and what you've learned and experienced with your parents um, as you've experienced this unprecedented time. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you, Naomi. Um, yeah, it has definitely been a learning experience, but as I was telling Rick um, one day, he checked in to see how we were doing. I said, you know, it feels like this was the perfect time to start a school. And this was the perfect time to start I Dream because we have to work with families. And that's, that's, our, that's at the core of our model. Um, we have always, we, we did it before we even opened to um, design with families and design with the communities. Well, you have to in this pandemic because we are in their homes. I mean, we're 100% virtual with three-year-olds to seven-year-olds. Three-year-olds can't get online and, you know, get on and get on the Zoom link and get into class and, and, and do the work, you know, connect to on Seesaw. I mean, we have to work with families. And so our, this, this opened up the space for us to do that on a, just a, a, a level that, you know, everyone else has to do it as well. So um, that's one thing we learned that the partnership, while we knew it was important um, in this pandemic, it's extremely important. Like we can't, we can't implement our model without families involved, without grandmothers involved, without childcare providers involved. Like it's, we all have to work together um, to, to ensure the success of our learners. So that's, that's one thing. Um, mental health support and uh, the focus on social emotional learning, again, something that we had planned to do. Um, this is, it's, it's even more important now as we are um, trying to create a safe and nurturing space in a place where we can't eat, we can't connect, we can't, we can't hug a child, we can't, you know, um, connect with each other as staff. So we are really having to focus on, um, we have tribe time with our staff, as well as tribe time with our learners. We, we had um, used bears, bears everywhere. Um, that's how we started the year with our social emotional learning curriculum and every child gets a teddy bear that they can name and put clothes on and build a home for and um, and that bear becomes their connection their attachment with the community with 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 their class um, we really are trying to figure out ways to um, connect with each other um, we have we just had social uh, meetups with families we have uh, outside, of course, um, just we it, we're just always thinking about how to build relationships. And again, relationships one of our core values. Um, we have dream keepers, so now we have 
a group of families and community elders and staff that they guide um, how we build those relationships and how, how we are making decisions in the school. Um, the, again, some, a voice that we knew we wanted to, to have in our decision making and we have that. And, but I think this pandemic has lent itself to, we need that because we can't get out in the community. Um, we, we can't connect with people. And so we rely on our dream keepers to, to be their ear, the ears on the ground. Let us know, you know, are we moving in the right direction? Are we making the right decisions? Um, so yeah, all of that, I think we've learned from this experience. Um, but again, it, 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 I'm excited because we are still creating the joyful, engaging, creative, curious type of learning that we wanna have once we're in the building, we're seeing that even, even virtually. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, thank um, you. It was interesting to hear you say this is the best time to start a school. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't imagine that. But I was terrified, sure. but, but it is because no one knows what they're doing right now. Yeah. So we're not You're really not alone. Cool. Yeah. Right. <laughs> not alone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for the work thank that you've done. Janine, thank you. And that was the mo most more cogent response than I could give at this time of the evening after waiting for us for hours and hours. So I appreciate that. Back in the day, I could do it. So yeah, <laughs> bring it back. Had to bring it back. Um, fantastic. So uh, so this is, um, we'll uh, be voting on this at our April meeting. Um, so we'll have a chance to ask any additional questions at that point. All right. Um, thank you, iDream team. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And board members, don't go anywhere because we're going to start the official public meeting um, with a very short agenda. Um, can I get a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve the March 15th, 2021 board meeting agenda. Second. Thank you. Uh, roll call vote, Jim Sandman. Aye. Naomi Shelton. Aye. Leah Crusey. That was an aye. Okay. Steve, Steve Pumbao. Aye. Sub Aye. And an aye from me as well. All right. We have a consent calendar. Would any board members like to remove everything, anything from the calendar for discussion? And do we have any recusals? If not, I will take a motion on the consent calendar. I move to approve all items on the consent calendar. Second. Okay. All right, uh, again, roll call vote, Saba Bereda. Aye. Steve Bumbao. Aye. Naomi Shelton. Aye. Jim Sandman. Aye. Leah Crusey. Aye. And an aye from me as well. Consent calendar passes. Any new business? <laughs> no? Uh, Naomi, do you want to talk about anything? <laughs> Not tonight, no. <laughs> Not tonight? Not tonight. All right. Then I will take a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn the March 15th, 2021 board meeting. Second. All right. Uh, roll call vote, Jim Sandman. Aye. Steve Bumbao. Aye. Leah Crusey. Aye. Naomi Shelton. Aye. Bob Mubreda. Aye. And an aye from me. Board members, thank you. Ending before midnight. Before midnight, yeah. Nine minutes. Good job. Michelle. Michelle, you wondered how late these could go. <laughs> welcome. And welcome. Thank you. Thanks for at home. Well, yeah. <laughs> thank, right. and thanks, to, thanks to the entire PC, PCSB team who. Yes. You have a possible. All right. Thank Thanks. you all. Good night. We're adjourned. Good night.